we drive everywhere we can go. We drive in the area here, and we just love the beauty of living here. You guys, if you've been here all your life and you've never been in other parts of the world, you have no idea how blessed you are. And we've spent a lot of time in a lot of other countries um, just as pastors and doing some missionary work. And uh, this is an amazing place to live. It really is. And so we're so thankful for that. This morning, I'm going to be uh, continuing our service, our series on 1 Peter chapter. We're in 1 Peter chapter 1. If you want to turn there in your app or in your Bible phone or in your, your analog Bible, which is what I call paper Bibles, and uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. I want to talk about being game-faced today, being game-faced. Oh, look at that. We're going to wait on that promo for next time. Oh, in your bulletin, by the way, is a mission sticker. It says he is worthy. That's for you to take home and put on your car or your computer or your coffee mug. It's an awesome sticker. P- people will ask you, what does that mean, he is worthy? But it's a really quality sticker. It's not real big but it's big enough to be seen. I put one on my car. And so I encourage you, that's a little gift that we got to remind you that our God is not just the God in our local area, but he's the God of all the peoples in the world, every nation, every tongue, every race. He's going to have people in every every group that are going to be worshiping before his throne. And that will remind us to pray and be supportive and to think about the amazing missionaries that we are blessed to have support. All right, so what does it mean to be game-faced? Game-faced. You ever heard the term? How many people have heard the term game-faced? Put on your game face. All right, a lot of people that are particularly younger and in sports, I'm seeing it. Good, that's that's very true because game-faced is all about getting ready for a competition, getting ready for a battle. And and how many of you guys have ever watched, and um, you don't have to raise your hand, admit this, but WWF or... uh, cage fighting or something like that. And you see these two guys, they're interviewing, the refs and the TV stations interviewing these two guys that are getting ready to fight. And so they have them in the same room, and maybe it's right before the fight, before the event, and these two guys come out, and and what do they look like? What do they look, what kind of expression do they have? They look like they're going to tear each other's limbs off, right? They've got their game face on. Now, why is that important? Why is that important? If you're about ready to go into a boxing match, what does doing that game face do for you? You guys are so quiet. Yeah, yeah. It changes something in your head, right? When you put that face on, it's like it does something in your chemistry that kind of gets you ready to face what is coming. Plus, you're hoping it's intimidating for the guy or the girl you're facing. So I have a couple slides, and this is one of them, the one before. I like her face even better. So you can go back one day. Yeah, look at that face. You, you want to get in the same ring with that girl? She looks like she's going to rip your head off. So we're going to be talking this morning. Peter's actually talking about putting on your game face, getting your head in the game. So let's, we're going to be looking at only um, uh, verses 13 through 16 of chapter 1. And so I'm going to read it first in the New Living Translation, and then in, in the Message New Testament, I thought J- Eugene Peterson just made it come alive. So let me, let's read this together. You can read it out loud if you want with me. So let's do it. So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say you must be holy because I am holy. All right, let's look at the message New Testament translation of that. Brings a little bit more modern vernacular. So roll up your sleeves. Get your head in the game. Be totally ready to receive the gift that's coming when Jesus arrives. 
Don't lazily slip back into those old grooves of evil, doing just what you feel like doing. You didn't know any better then, you do now. As obedient children, let yourselves be pulled into the, a way of life shaped by God's life, a life energetic and blazing with holiness. God said, I am holy, you be holy. Wow, a lot here. Let's pray. God, we ask that you'd come by your Spirit and help us this morning to receive what you're dishing out to us, what you're speaking to us, what you're calling us to engage you with. So, Lord, we just give you our minds now, we give you our hearts, and we ask you to help us to catch what you're saying here to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So he starts this whole paragraph off with the word, so. You know, in, in other translations, your word, your Bible might say, therefore, okay? And what that means is that this is, he's talking about this as the result of what he just talked about. And in these first verses of the previous verses of chapter 1, Peter, again, he's writing to believers that he doesn't know that were, were brought to Christ and, and discipled by the Apostle Paul and his team. But Paul is now in a Roman prison and he's going to be executed next year. And these people in, in these churches in, in what's called Asia Minor, modern country of Turkey, um, they are freaked out because their spiritual father is no more, or almost no more. And so Peter's writing to them to comfort them, and he's trying to show them, this is what God has done for you, this is who God has been for you, and, and because of that, you can do this. You can face what is coming ahead in your life. And they know it's not going to be easy. So just as a quick review, look at these 14 things that... Peter has told them about themselves that God has done for them. They've been chosen by God. And think about this being you, okay? Because this is written to you. It's written to the church. Been chosen. You've been set apart. You've been cleansed by Jesus' blood. You've been shown God's mercy. And there's verses next to all these to show you where it is in this chapter. You've been born again. You've been given hope through Jesus' resurrection. You've been given an inheritance, a heavenly inheritance. You've been given an eternal future. You will never die. You will live forever with God and all of His people. Isn't that amazing? You're guarded by God's power. How amazing is that? You're experiencing God's glory. You're being saved through the transformation of our soul, your soul. You're made into, God has made you His special people. And you're the object of many prophecies in the Bible. This, you and I are here in this house today. We are the object of many prophecies that were given in the Old Testament. We have received the good news, and we are making angels jealous. Now that one messes with my head. I hope it messes with your head too. We are making angels jealous. Somebody asked me about that last week. They said, Pastor, I can't understand. Why would angels be jealous? And then I realized because they've never experienced God's grace. They've never experienced forgiveness. But we have. So maybe all that stuff we went through in our lives actually helps us to realize how much God loves us because He's shown us His great love. So you got to put that list on your fridge. These 14 things that Peter tells us are true about us. Thank you for passing those out, Mary. I appreciate that. So he says, so, in light of all those things, prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Beginning at verse 13. So I want to talk about this phrase, prepare your minds for action. And I have to put on something. Some of you might remember I have a King James Bible. It's got a really interesting phrase for this translation of what we just read here is prepare your minds for action. It's the word gird. Gird up the loins of your mind. 
you got a King James, is that right? Anybody reading the King James? Yeah, I hear, I see that hand. It says, gird up the loins of your mind. Now we're thinking, what a weird phrase is that? Gird up the loins of your mind. But when you start, t- when, I, when, I took that, when I took that apart and looked at the original language that it meant, I realized it was really, really a great phrase that helps understand what Peter's talking about. The word gird, where we get the word girdle, ladies, where we get the word girder, you constructors, it means literally to encircle or to, like a belt. And it means to put something around you. Literally means to tuck in the loose ends of a robe or a loincloth that somebody was wearing. Remember back in these days, the Middle, Middle East, there's a picture there. Uh, next, next one that shows uh, robes still common today, right? Those long flowing robes that they wear in Saudi Arabia and places like that. It literally means to tuck those in, tuck the ends of your robe in, For a purpose, so you can do things you can't do with your long flowing robes. What are some things you can't do with long flowing robes on? Run. That's the first one, (laughs) yeah. What else? Uh, Climb. What about if you're going into battle? Can you fight real well with long flowing robes on? No. So Peter is saying to us, I want you to tuck in the loose ends that are hindering you from being able to do what you've got to do, what's coming down the pike, to be able to respond to it. I want you to gird up the loins of your mind. In other words, I want you to tuck in those loose things that keep you from being mobile and able to respond. Now, this is crazy because this verse is actually in four or five, this phrase is actually in four or five, six places in the Bible. I had no idea. For example, the one we probably know the best is is, uh, referring to battle. Any idea where that is? Put on the put on the the belt of truth. Perry got it. Woo! Perry, way to go. That word belt of truth is gird up your loins with truth. And I think the King James, that's what it says. And so that's talking about getting our minds saturated with God's truth so when the enemy hits us with lies, we know how to respond. Remember when Jesus went was tempted in the wilderness, the enemy said, you can make bread out of these stones if you're so hungry, and then you can eat, this, eat, this, eat that bread. And Jesus said, uh-uh, the Word of God says this. And so, how about you? Can you respond to enemy attacks? Can you respond to the lies? Do you have enough of God's word in your soul, in your spirit, in your mind? Proverbs 31 talks about girding up. Uh, it's, the, it's the Proverbs 31 woman. It says she girds herself with strength. And again, that's King James because you know, nobody knows what gird means these days. She girds herself with strength. In other words, she gets herself prepared to deal with what needs to be done. And reading in that chapter, she's a businesswoman. She works hard. She does stuff. And it requires that she has mobility and flexibility. In Job 38, 3, the Lord says to Job, Gird up your loins and face me. He's basically telling Job, he's saying, Job, I want to have it out with you. So get your, get your mind in the game and let's sit down and talk about it. So he and Job were having a little argument there. Job 38.3. In 1 Kings 18.46, we have what somebody just mentioned, Mary, I think it was. Elijah, after he's, he's on the Mount Carmel and he kills all the 400 prophets of Baal and made Jezebel really mad, and then the, it's, been a, it's been a drought for three and a half years, and, and, uh, Isaac, and, and the prophet tells the king, he says, um, it's going to rain. And remember, he prays. And the cloud appears, and then he says, rain's coming fast. So it says, I, it says that Elijah girded up his loins and started running, and he, ran, he, out, he, he ran, outran all the horses and the, all the soldiers and everybody. 
and he just ran like the wind, like a leopard. But it says he girded up his loins. He prepared himself to be able to run without being hindered. And finally, we read that the prodigal son's father, when he saw him coming up the driveway, it says that he, he ran to meet him. And it doesn't say there specifically that he girded up his robe to run, but the father wore long, beautiful robes, and there's no way he could have run to, catch his, to, to greet his son down that long road unless he had hitched him up. So this morning, this is all about Are you, is your head in the game? Are you preparing yourself to face what is coming down our pike, our road, what we are facing in our world? Are you preparing yourself? Are you thinking about what that means? Are you talking with the Lord about it? This is a really important question that we ask. How do we get our heads in the game? What's really going on? We don't want to be the proverbial ostrich that's got his head buried in the sand. And it's really easy to do. It's so easy to tune out today. How many of you sometimes, like we sometimes do, just lay on bed and watch videos? YouTube, Facebook videos, and you just kind of tune out. It's really a kind of an escape, isn't it? I guilty sometimes. God's calling us. Let me read again what Eugene Peterson said. Roll up your sleeves. Get your head in the game. Be totally ready to receive the gift that's coming when Jesus arrives. Mixed in with that phrase, gird up your loin, the loins of your mind with soberness from King James. That word sober actually means to exercise self-control, to be calm, to be aware to be vigilant of what's going on around you. That's so important for us today. There's so much going on, and we need to be listening to the Lord and talking to Him about, Lord, what is coming? Lord, how do I prepare myself? How do I prepare my family? Especially when we have children and we feel that sense of responsibility. Lord, how do I prepare my kids for this world? So that not only will they survive, but they'll thrive. So I translated this verse in my own, my own efforts this way. Hitch up your mental genes and keep moving forward, sober, calm, and aware of what's going on around you. The next thing he says, Peter says to us is, put all your hope in the grace that you're going to receive when Jesus is revealed to the world. So what's Peter talking about here? He's talking about having a, a future-pointed-looking perspective. He's talking about not dwelling in the past, not caught up only in the present, but I am looking at life and I'm living my life with an eye towards what God has said is coming for me, how God has provided for me and my loved ones. Put all your hope in the grace that's coming. That word hope means an expected good future. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. An expected good future. How many of you hear people go, oh, it's only going to be this way. Everything's going to hell in a handbasket, and the world is falling apart, a government's falling apart, and there's some truth to that. But God says that we can expect good things. We can expect Him to be helping us and walking with us through whatever is coming. So there is a hope for us. And not only just on this earth, but we have a hope for eternity. Even if the earth, the rest of our time on the earth isn't very exciting, in fact, it may be really hard, God's saying, your time on earth is so temporary. You've got to be thinking eternity, an eternal perspective. Paul talks it, about it in Romans 8. He talks about an eternal weight of glory that is coming after you go through this temporary time of suffering. He says, that we're going to receive grace. There's grace moving towards us, coming towards us. That word grace we talked about last week or the week before, it means God's favor and help. Peter is saying, God is going to help you. He's got favor on you. You are a recipient of His grace, of His favor, and He's going to be there with you to bring you through whatever you've got to face. 
And not just in Peter's time when those people were facing the persecution of the Roman Emperor Nero. Many remember that name. And the one following him, Domitian or whoever it was. But they faced horrible persecution as Christians in the Roman Empire. But today, even we need to take to heart the same thing Peter said to them is true for us. There's God's grace and favor is with us. It's for us. We've got to buy into it. We've got to start looking for it and focus on that and not on what's wrong and what's hard right now. He says that grace is going to come. We're going to receive the fullness of that grace when Jesus is revealed to the world. Anybody looking for that? Jesus is coming back. Physically, he's coming back. We've, we've been told that in the end of the book of at the end of the Gospels, the beginning of Acts, he says, this same Jesus, as you saw him go, he's going to come back. And I just want to read a couple passages because it helps us remember when is this going to happen. Now, we know that no one knows the day or the hour, but Jesus gives us the season pretty accurately. He says, immediately after the anguish or the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, The stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. This is Matthew 24. And then at last, the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens. And there will be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth. It makes you wonder, what is that sign? That all the peoples of the earth are going to begin mourning. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Everyone in the world will see Jesus returning. Everyone. It's not a hidden return. It's a completely public return. And it says in verse 31, He will send out His angels with a mighty blast of a trumpet, and they will gather together His chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. Wow. So if you're there on that day, and that would be a tough place to be because of the tribulation in those days, you're going to see, and he's going to make sure that you are brought in. He will gather you up. Paul tells us and tells the believers of his own day that were struggling with, has the Lord already come? They weren't sure. People were telling him that Jesus had already returned and and they'd missed out. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 through 17, he says, We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living, when the Lord returns, will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. Now this is talking about the second coming of Jesus. It's not talking about the rapture. We've talked about the rapture at length before. And and that there is room to have different opinions of when that will take place. Whether it will be at the same time this happens or whether it will precede the tribulation. So I'm not going to go into that one today because you never get out of it. It takes forever. All right. Hold on to your hope. When Jesus returns, he's bringing God's reward with him for you. You are graced because you belong to him. You're his child. It's an amazing thing. So I I kind of translated this verse. Keep thinking big picture, long term, that Jesus is returning soon to reward his faithful ones and not about the short term difficulties you're facing right now. All right, let's move on. Verse 14, beginning of it, he says, Peter says, you must live in light of this as God's obedient children. So what is obedience? The word actually comes from a Greek word that means to listen. Right? How many of you had small children? And when you asked them something, they just tuned you out. Because to not listen is to be disobedient. Isn't that interesting? How that means Obedience means whether you're really listening, because if you're really listening, then you will obey, you will respond. 
In Ezekiel chapter 20, Brooke pointed this out the other day. We were doing our our um, you, you, our, vari- our, our Bible um, program. In Ezekiel 20, verse 13, we read, The people of Israel rebelled against me, the Lord says, and they refused to obey my decrees in, there in the wilderness. They wouldn't obey my regulations, even though obedience would have given them life. Obedience would have given them life. We always think obedience is such a mean, nasty, hard word. Oh, God wants me to obey Him. But we don't put together the fact that God says that the laws that I give you, the things that I ask you to do, are for you to have life. He has His reasons for the things He asks us to do, for the pattern of lifestyle that He calls us to walk. God's not trying to make life hard for us. He's actually trying to make life full of of a fruitful, fun experience of joy in our lives. That was Ezekiel 20, verse 13. In Philippians 2, Paul, the Apostle Paul says this, and this is really interesting. He says, work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. Did you hear that? God never asks us to do anything that He doesn't help us do. He says, I want you to obey me, so I'm giving you the desire to obey me. But you still have to choose. Let me read that again. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. If you've been really saved, your life should look different. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. That's, that's just, I could do a whole sermon on that. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. When He says you must do this, that means He's given you a choice. You have the Holy Spirit living in you to help you to change the way you think. How many of you can say this morning, um, I used to have a lot of different desires than I do right now. I used to be tempted by things that no longer have power over me. Since God has changed, He's renewed my mind. That's possible for every one of us. I'm going to take this off. I'm getting warm. But I like my bathrobe. That was a gift from Brooke a long time ago. Verse 14. B, or the second second phrase, and he says, don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. Peter is warning them here. He's saying, and the word is really interesting in the original language, it means to fall back into a previous pattern. It's like a rut you can't get out of. Falling back into a way you used to think. And it actually uses the word that says, when you didn't know God. Falling into the same old pattern you used to do when you didn't know God. To satisfy your own desires. And that's the craving and the longings of the flesh. The things that comforted you. The things that you got your thrill from. I'm not going to ask you to give examples. But every one of us knows what were the things that we used to do. What were the habits we used to have. What were the addictions we used to have? The things that that we've got to be careful because if we begin to focus on those things, we can get caught back up and they begin to take over our view, our, our horizon, and we start to lose touch with the Lord. He calls us to be vigilant about these things, to be aware. I used to be totally into restoring old cars to where it took over so much of my imagination and so much of my my thought life, I would dream about restoring old cars. And it took the Lord a long time to help me realize that that was an idol in my life. And I had to repent of it and and just drop it and begin to think about things that are going to last, not things that are going to rust. And old cars, they're definitely rusting. Choosing things that will be eternal and not temporary. I translated this verse, or this part of this verse, don't get sidetracked by the lures of this world, around, of the world around you, 
that appealed to you to your old cravings and habits when you didn't know God. Because now you do know God. There's a whole lot of contrast here. The old, the new, knowing God, not knowing God. Those things that, those, de- those desires, those things that attracted you versus the things of God, spiritual things, things of life that God wants you to be caught up with now. Verse, verse 15 begins, Now you must be holy in all you do, just as God who chose you is holy. Holy, there's that word again, that religious word that we struggle with. It's the word that we immediately, we think of, of old ladies with dresses down to the ground, no makeup on, their hair in a bun, a severe look on their face. And I had a, a great grandmother, where she was just the epitome. She was a Presbyterian covenanter from Scotland. And she was one tough customer. I hear, I heard from my great grandmother and my, my great uncle when they knew her when she died before I was born. But they used to talk about Grandpa, I think it was Mackenzie or something like that, and uh, and the, how hard she was. And the, man, you didn't, you had to mind your p's and q's, or she would whack you with a stick or something. But that's not holiness. That's not holiness. That's our. That's the, what the. That's what the enemy wants us to believe holiness is. Some old fashioned thing that's just oppressive. Holiness is all about this. See this ring. That I put on my finger in 1981. This is a ring that says, I'm taken. I belong to her. I'm not available. I'm set apart. I am hers and she is mine. Holy, this means I'm consecrated to her. I'm set apart. I'm given completely to her. I'm loyal to her. I'm faithful to her. That's what holiness is. That's what God asks for. He asks for your heart. He asks for you to give yourself to Him. To entrust yourself into His care. To say, I'm taken. I belong to God. That's why the wedding ring is such a wonderful thing. We just saw one of those put on this couple back in the corner. This last week, we got married on Thursday. And... uh, so they got their rings. You got your ring? Yeah, there it is. <laughs> awesome. Apostle Paul says in, in uh, Colossians 2, verse 20 through 23, Why do you keep on following the rules of the world, such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? Such rules are mere human teachings about things that will deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. I hear an amen out there. That is a powerful verse. It's just kind of a shocking verse in the Bible. Paul is saying that all that self-denial and stuff is it's not what he's looking for. That doesn't change your heart desires. God changes your heart desires by His Spirit as you walk with Him, as you worship Him, as you as you talk with Him, as you pray to Him, as you give Him your heart. He says here in this verse that, that God chose you. That word means He's called you. It's the word that means to call. He's called you to be His son and His daughter. He's called you into a relationship with Him. Christianity... If it just devolves into religion, it's just rules. It's dry. It's no good. It's like eating old, stale bread. But when we walk with our Savior, moment by moment on a daily basis, is full of life. And He transforms our desires. I don't even recognize who I used to be. I'm so thankful. And He continues to do that in my life, and I've seen that in many of your lives. He says to be holy in all you do, that word do is a, is a word that means to conduct yourself or to make choices of how you're going to live. It's, it has to do with outward behavior being changed because of inward beliefs that have changed. God has done something in my heart, and so it's affecting the way I live now among the people I'm around. 
You must be holy in all you do, just as God who chose you is holy. So you've got to catch the point here is that God's not telling you to, He's not saddling you with more to-dos. He's saying, come into relationship with me, and that will itself will transform you, your desires that will reflect itself in your lifestyle and your choices. I love this. I, wrote, I rewrote the verse this way. As chosen sons of daughter and daughters, live out your true destiny in close fellowship with your heavenly Father. Remember who you are and whose you are. And set your heart to walk close to Him through the power that He gives. I love that song we sing, Love Came Down and Rescued Me. It's got that part that says, I am yours, I am yours, all my days. Jesus, I am yours. That's the root of it. If you don't have that kind of a relationship with God, then you're just dealing with religion and do's and don'ts. And that's just really not going to last long. You're going to get sick and tired of that. That's religion. And it doesn't have any power in it. Verse 16, for the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. Again, the Lord is saying, this is who I am and I want you to come and and be part of the relationship with me. And, and I need to be able to transform you and change you. So the first thing he's done is that he's cleansed and washed you. We read that in uh, previous verses. So he's forgiven you. So in his eyes, you're already holy when it comes to your status, your standing. In fact, he writes uh, in the New Testament, you read all these letters that Paul wrote to the Corinthians who had more issues with sexuality and perversion and all kinds of crazy stuff going on in their church. And he called them holy. He told them they were holy. It's because their holiness, the standing we have with God, doesn't have anything to do with our struggles right now. They have everything to do with our putting our faith in Jesus' sacrifice to cover my sins, to forgive me, so that I stand in confidence right now before Him because of what Jesus did for me. He set me on a rock, David said. And now from that place of being forgiven, of being saved, being born again, now God said, all right, now we're going to work on you. We're going to work on your mind. We're going to work on your soul. We're going to work on your emotions. We're going to bring healing to you. We're going to see transformation come as you live out that salvation that's begun inside of you. So you are already holy in your standing before God, and now God wants to make you holy in your conduct and in your thinking. And that's a gift from Him called, the, that another big word, sanctification. It's that process of transformation as we let God's Spirit shine His light on us and help us and change us as we're in a, in a loving, worshiping relationship with Him. So I translated this verse, and, and it comes from uh, Leviticus 20, verse 7, which says, Consecrate yourselves and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. That's who Peter's quoting here. So I translated it, Keep focused on how awesome and wonderful God is, and that He's told us in the Scriptures that we can experience becoming like Him if we just keep moving forward in our walk with Him. You're, you're going to become... Scientists tell us we become like whatever it is we're giving our attention to. If you're caught up with God and focused on Him, you're going to become like Him. His values, His, His heart is going to become your heart, your values. If you're caught up and focused on other things like Game of Thrones or, or what is it, the, the, the Rings of Power or whatever, the latest stuff is on. If that's what you're thinking about all the time, guess what? You become, you, you're affected by that. It changes who you are. It changes the way you think. It changes your desire. That's why, why the prophet said, choose you this day who you're going to serve. Focus on him and you become like him. All right, let's put it all together. I took those each of these verses that I kind of translated into my own words after my own study, I put it all together in one paragraph. There it is. So hitch up your mental genes. Remember the tight, hitch up the belt and your girdle. And keep moving forward, sober, calm, and aware of what's going on around you. Keep thinking big picture, long term, that Jesus is returning soon to reward his faithful ones 
and not about the short-term difficulties you're facing right now. As chosen sons and daughters, live out your true destiny in close fellowship with your Heavenly Father. Don't get sidetracked by the lures of the world around you that appeal to your old cravings and habits when you didn't know God. Instead, remember who you are and whose you are and set your heart to walk close with Him in the power that He gives. Keep focused on how awesome and wonderful He is and that He has told us in the Scriptures that we can actually experience becoming like Him, being made holy. All right, now we've got some hard questions today. So I encourage you guys to wrestle with these. I might ask if there's even uh, a response. We've got a few minutes here. If you want to throw out some answers, you're good. But I really want you to take these home. That's why I really want you to use your app or grab the paper that Rosie passed out, my notes, and wrestle with these things because I believe God is saying to the degree that you let these things get into you is the degree that you're going to be able to thrive in what's coming down the road coming down from our future, what our world is going to, what our nation is heading towards. God wants us to not just survive. He wants us to thrive. He wants us to navigate. He wants us to surf those waves. And it's not going to happen unless we uh, internalize these things that Peter's telling us. So the first question is, how do I, quote, gird up the loins of my mind? How do I get my game face on? How do I prepare for the quote, battle of the mind, and maybe it's not a coincidence that our ladies group is doing a study on a book called The Battle of the Mind, right? Maybe that was God preparing you a little bit for what he's speaking to us. So how do you gird up the loins of your mind? How do you get your head in the game? How do you get your mind ready for what is coming? Think about that a minute. What are things that you can actually do? Where can you be giving your attention? What could you be reading? What could you, who could you be talking to? Secondly, how do I hold on to eternal perspective and the hope of Jesus' return? You know, Peter tells us, Second Peter, that there's a time coming when people are going to say, where's the hope of his coming? They've been telling us he's going to return for years and years and generations and generations, and he hasn't come yet, so maybe they're just making it all up, right? We have to hold on to the hope of his coming. Jesus said over and over and over again, he said, be ready, be ready. Don't be like the virgins that let their oil run low. And when he, was, when he came back, they're stuck outside the gate. Don't be like the steward or the manager of the estate that started, when my master's late in coming, so he started beating up the other servants. He started abusing his relationships, taking advantage of them, misusing people. God said that his, ser- his master will return on an hour when he's not ready. How about you? How do I avoid slipping back into old life patterns and old life appetites? It all starts here. Where you're letting your mind and your imagination go. You guys should write down the things the Holy Spirit's speaking to you about and act on them. I really would like to have all of you with me when I meet Jesus. I really would. <laughs> what does holy mean for a believer? Is it possible? This from the inside out holiness, not the outside in. It doesn't matter what kind of a long dress you have or whether you wear makeup or jewelry or not or play cards or, or go to movies or go with girls that do or guys that do. It has everything to do with Letting Jesus rule and reign from inside here. That's what makes us holy. How do I increase in becoming holy? I'm not going to tell you my answer because it's not going to ever be your answer. It might be, I don't know. But you need to wrestle with this, not me. 
I mean, I need to wrestle with it too, but I can't wrestle for you. Fifth question, if rules don't help me conquer my evil desires, what does help me? You should know the answer to that one. And last of all, what steps will I take today to do God's word, to do the things he's spoken to me this morning? I just want to sing that little chorus as we close. I am yours. I am yours all my days. Jesus, I am yours. Can you join me? I am yours. I am yours all my days. Jesus, I am yours. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Let it do its work in us. Apostle, Jeremiah said, your word is like a hammer. And that's because we get really hard and really resistant. And I ask you'd help us, Lord, not to need the hammer because we would have tender hearts and allow you to work in us and be responsive to you. So I ask your help today and I ask you bless your people as they go. That maybe your blessing isn't always making life easy for them, but maybe it's slowing them down enough to really hear your voice. Maybe it's putting up a roadblock to stop them into going into something that's going to wound them and wound their family and cause their hearts to grow cold and hard to you. So, Lord, you do what you need to do in us. Have your way and do what's best. But most of all, do what draws us closer to you. And we just thank you for this morning and for your goodness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So if anybody desires to be prayed for, we have folks that will be up here to pray for you. I encourage you to come and have a wonderful afternoon.